Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at prophecy, the signature of God, in our continuing study of apologetics. Isaiah chapter 41, the prophet says, and he's actually speaking for the Lord, (laughs) present your case, the Lord says, bring forward your strong arguments. And of course, in apologetics, that's what we're doing. We're giving evidence Uh, for God, for not just for any God, for the God of the scriptures. And that's what happens here. The king of Jacob says, uh, let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and, and know their outcome or announce to us what is coming. He continues, declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are, and notice that you are gods. (laughs) It's a challenge that that the Lord makes, that his prophet makes, to the pagan gods of the nations. You try to do this. You try to predict the future. Indeed, do good or evil that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. We continue in chapter 42, verse 8. Uh, I am the Lord. That is my name. This is God speaking. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things before they spring forth. I proclaim to you. So God is saying, look, I'm going to tell you the future before it takes place. And then when it does take place, you'll know <laughs> I'm God. I'm not, I'm not just like all of those other pagan gods. I am the God who is there. The first prophecy we want to look at, uh, and this is still in Isaiah, just a few chapters later, Isaiah chapter 44, um, and he mentions by name this king Cyrus the Great. Uh, He doesn't call him the the Great, but notice, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Now, when Isaiah says those words, Isaiah lived... In, in the day when the temple was still standing, um, it, it was, but eventually it would be destroyed and it would remain destroyed. The city, would, the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed. The temple would be destroyed until the coming of this Cyrus the Great. Um, and and it, he's mentioned by name here. We continue uh, chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, it's striking that he calls him the anointed one. That's usually a term that's reserved for, well, priests were anointed and prophets were anointed and God's kings were anointed. But here's this pagan king Cyrus to his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. That's, <laughs> think about what that means uh, graphically. Uh, to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. He continues, verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of sacred places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. Notice, it's very clear. You begin to wonder as you're reading this prophecy, but the prophecy itself says, look, Cyrus didn't know God. Uh, Cyrus was a pagan king, and yet God says, I knew Cyrus, and I was calling him to do something special. By the way, the special thing that he was being called to do, we know this from history, uh, when Cyrus first... uh, um, conquered Babylon when he became this this world ruler. Um, the first thing that Cyrus did after the con- conquest of Babylon is he said, "All of you people that have been dispossessed, including, including you Jewish people that are here in Babylon, because you've been taken away into the Babylonian captivity, you can all go home." and you can all rebuild your temples. <laughs> so um, what Cyrus does for the Jewish people, he did for everybody else. But he did it for the Jewish people. And the prophet says, I'm setting you up. God says, I'm setting you up because of what you're going to do for the people of Israel. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, for Israel, my chosen people. Now, there's a question here with regard to time. Isaiah, as, as I said, uh, lives in the, in the late 800s, uh, close to uh, seven, well, actually in, this, in the 700s, excuse me, um, uh, around 721 BC. He saw the northern kingdom of Israel taken into captivity. Um, and, and then he saw Assyria come down and try to do the same thing with the southern kingdom of Judah. That story is talked about in, in Isaiah chapter 
uh, 36 and 37. Um, and, and of course, he knew about the kingdom of, of, of Babylon, uh, but Babylon wasn't a great empire in Isaiah's day. Uh, it would be eventually, and Isaiah prophesied about how Babylon would eventually come and take the, uh, take the Jews into captivity. Uh, but that wouldn't t- take place until, until uh, the 600s. And then Cyrus, um, he comes on the scene. Uh, the fall of Babylon is 539 B.C. So notice, that's about 150 years later. So quite a big difference that are between the two. Now, the objection is sometimes made. Could Isaiah have been written after the event? Remember, Isaiah is living um, in, the, in the 700s. Could Isaiah have been written after the event to make it look like prophecy? And indeed, there are those that, that try to say uh, Isaiah, or at least the latter half of the book of Isaiah, the part that contains this prophecy, Isaiah chapter 40 through chapter 66, uh, is claimed that this must have been written after the event that this was written um, not by Isaiah himself, because he wouldn't have lived that long, but by other somebody else writing on, in his name. Um, and it, because it's, it's very unusual to not only prophesy, but to prophesy and then give somebody's na- actual name. That's an unusual thing, even, even for the Bible, which does contain future prophecy. And so this, this question comes up, and, and I think it's a legitimate question to ask. Uh, it, was this a prophecy? And if it was a prophecy, was it really given before, before Cyrus was even born? Um, now, um, I'm, I'm inclined to just take the Bible at its word, but there are even Bible-believing Christians who say, well, maybe, maybe the last half of Isaiah, since Isaiah's name is actually mentioned in the last half, um, and it's it's so very different in its tone um, that maybe maybe this is written by a later generation and appended to the book of Isaiah. Now, let me just say for the record, every copy of Isaiah that we've ever found has all it's it's all together, including including the copies of Isaiah that we found in the Dead Sea Scroll. You see, one of the uh, very first things about the scrolls that were found when the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were initially discovered in 1947 um, in, by this little community by the shores of the Dead Sea. And in the initial find, the seven scrolls were first found, and after that, um, scholars went through all the different caves that were there and, and found quite a number of, of either scrolls or pieces and portions of scrolls. Um, and Isaiah was of of all of them was one of the most common books that was found. Actually, three books that were the most uh, copied were um, were Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Psalms. Uh, it just happens to be the three most quoted books in the New Testament as well. Um, but in the initial find were two copies of Isaiah, and they had both halves. And so that wasn't something that you know you had a first Isaiah and a second Isaiah. But uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls date from around 250, actually all the way to 50 AD, past the time of Jesus. But the, the Isaiah scrolls actually uh, date to quite, quite an early period, but still long before Isaiah lived and long before Cyrus lived. And so let's look instead at a second uh, writer. This time it's Ezekiel that we're going to look at. Ezekiel chapter 26, uh, beginning verse 2, and he lives at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Um, Ezekiel writes, Son of Man, because Tyre, and he's writing about the city of Tyre, and we're we're going to look at that on a map in in, in a moment, Uh, because Tyre has said concerning Jerusalem, aha, the gateway of the peoples is broken. Um, It has opened to me. I shall be filled now that she is laid waste. You see, what had happened is Jerusalem was being conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. He had come down. And the people of Tyre, just up the coast, are saying, oh, look at that. Uh, Jerusalem is being conquered. Um, that means that um, we can, uh, now that she's being laid waste, I can be filled. I can go and um, I can benefit from, from Jerusalem's fall. I can go pick up slaves really, you know, Jewish slaves really cheaply. I can go loot the city that has been laid waste. Uh, And because Tyre had that that idea, verse 3, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. So notice, uh, God says to Tyre, 
I'm going to bring up many nations, not just a single nation, uh, as, a, as the sea brings up its waves. Notice the sea doesn't just come in with one wave. If you've ever built a sound castle on the sea, uh, you saw maybe the, the tide start to come up and the, the waves come in and break up that sand castle, not with just a single wave, but with wave after wave after wave. And that's the way, that's the, way the sea does. Now, as I said, Tyre was just up the coast. If we look at a map of Judah, of course, Judah, uh, you'd initially had Judah as the, one of the tribes of Israel, but the northern kingdom of Israel had been taken away into captivity. Uh, so you had Judah with Jerusalem uh, there in, in, uh, to the west of the Dead Sea. Uh, and then to the north, right on the coast, you had this, this kingdom, actually the city of Tyre. It was an ocean-going people. Uh, they were known as the Phoenicians. Uh, because in that region around Tyre, uh, that, that's the country today they call Lebanon, and the the cedars of Lebanon, these big, tall cedar trees, were perfect for building ships. And the Phoenicians, people of Tyre and the other Phoenician cities that were there on the coast to the north of Tyre, uh, they used that to great advantage. In fact, what they had done is they had built Phoenician colonies all throughout the Mediterranean, uh, North Africa, Spain, places like Sicily and Sardinia, uh, Crete and, and Cyprus. These were all places where Phoenicians had settled and set up this big giant sort of trading arena. And of course, the, the head of that were, were these cities right on the, uh, on the, uh, to the north of Israel, like Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos. Um, the prophecy goes on, verse uh, chapter 26, verse 4, they will destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her, her towers, and I will scrape her debris from her and make her a bare rock. Now, when you read that, you say, well, is that some sort of figurative language? And there are times when the Bible does speak figuratively, but we're going to see that this is going to be literally fulfilled. Uh, verse 5 goes on to say, she will be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken, declares the Lord, and she will become spoil for the nations. And so God, God says, look, Tyre is going to be destroyed, and destroyed in a very particular way. The, ver the passage goes on, also her daughters who are on the mainland will be slain by the, by the sword. They will know that I am the Lord. Now notice this reference to the daughters on the mainland. You say, well, isn't Tyre all on the mainland? Well, no, it actually is not. If you look at the city of Tyre, it's actually, there's two parts, a little bit like Miami and Miami Beach. That's just down the road from where I live. Uh, you had the island city of Tyre. And then you had the, had the mainland city of Tyre because uh, there were just too many people on the island. They wouldn't all fit. And so um, I'm not sure if the city had started on, on the island or it started on the mainland. I, I suspect the latter. Um, but it was a city that was located in two areas. There was the mainland city and there was the island city. Um, and uh, you had these big uh, harbors on the island. I uh, don't think you had anything quite like that on the mainland. Uh, so, but you could, you know, it was about half mile off the coast. And the, the passage goes on to say, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon that did come against Tyre after he had come and attacked uh, Jerusalem. He came up against Tyre. Uh, king of Babylon, king of kings with horses, chariots, cavalry, and a great army. He goes on to say, he, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, he will slay your daughters on the mainland with a sword. Notice, he only speaks of the mainland there. And he will make siege walls against you, cast up a ramp against you, and raise up a large shield against you. He goes on, the, the blow of his battering ramps, he will direct against your walls. And with his axes, he will break down your towers. Verse 10, because of the multitude of his horses, the dust raised by them will cover you. Your walls will shake at the sound of cavalry and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city that is breached. And so these are all things that Nebuchadnezzar would do. And from our point of view, now that it's taken place, did do um, later on in Ezekiel's day. So, so yes, Ezekiel prophesied, but then uh, it happened in fairly short order. It happened, uh, you know, within, uh, actually, t it took a 10-year siege for him to capture uh, the mainland city. 
Uh, we go on to read verse 11 with the hoofs of his horses. He will trample all your streets. He will slay your peoples with a sword. Your strong pillars will come down to the ground. But now, as we get to verse 12, there is a chain, uh, a change. Uh, they will make a spoil of your riches and a prey of your merchandise, break down your walls and destroy your, your pleasant houses and throw your stones and your timbers and your debris into the water. Um, now, uh, it could be, if we were just reading this for the first time, we thought, well, look at that. Uh, he's talk been talking about what Nebuchadnezzar would do, and now the focus is upon they, presumably Nebuchadnezzar's army, although it doesn't say that. But there's a change in the pronoun. It goes to the plural instead of the singular. Um, in, instead of Nebuchadnezzar, it's, it's the, whoever they is. Uh, is, is going to notice, to throw your stones and your timbers and your debris into the water. Uh, so I will silence the sound of your songs, and the sound of your harps will be heard no more. Verse 14, I will make you a bare rock. You will be a place for the spreading of nets, which had been mentioned at the beginning of the prophecy. So here's a repetition of that. You will be a, pla a, a bare rock, a place for the spreading of nets, you will be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Lord God. We're going to back up and look at, at where Tyre is located on, on our larger map. Uh, you, see, you still see Judah, you see Babylon and Tyre. But Tyre continued there for the next 10, 20, 30, uh, 40 years. As, as I said, the, the mainland city had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar, by Babylon. But the island city continued to prosper for the next 100, 200 years until, until the coming of Alexander the Great, that, that Macedonian king from northern Greece, from the area known as uh, Macedon. And Alexander came in the year 332 BC. He had marched um, the previous year across the uh, uh, what we call Turkey today, Anatolia. Uh, and then he came down uh, against Tyre, and nearly every city he came to, uh, he'd come to the city, they'd open their gates, they'd let him in, and he'd said, uh, from now on, you're part of my kingdom, you're part of my empire, uh, if you were king, now you're going to be paying taxes to me, uh, but he actually was quite generous, uh, he would he would allow the people and the rulers uh, some autonomy, as long as they surrendered to him. Um, now, if they fought, that was a different matter, uh, and he had already defeated twice uh, the, the Persian Empire, which, uh, remember, we talked about Cyrus, who had given rise to the Persian Empire after, after Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. Um, and he came to Tyre, and for the first time now, in quite some time, uh, he came to Tyre, and, and the people of Tyre, since they were on an island and Alexander didn't have much in the way of a navy, <laughs> they said, he said, surrender, and they said, no, we're not going to do that. And, you know, you can't reach us. Uh, we're a half mile off the coast. So you don't have any bridges. You don't have a, a lot in the way of boats. We're the ones that have the big Navy. Um, and so they said, you can just go on your way, Alexander. We're not interested. And he said, really? Well, we will see about that. Uh, Alexander proceeded to build a causeway from the mainland, which had now been destroyed by Babylon, all the way out to the island city. And to, to find the supplies for this, for this causeway, <laughs> he took all of that, um, all the ruins, the houses, the walls, everything from the mainland city of Tyre, he threw, literally, threw into the sea to make this causeway over a space of about six months. Um, they, <laughs> the Phoenicians tried to stop him. They sent their navy. They, they sent, uh, they, were, they were shooting from the walls as, as he got closer. But at the end of that period, six, seven month siege, uh, on July 29th, 332 BC, um, they broke through. He, he had gathered some ships uh, by now and they helped. And so he made sort of a two-pronged two attack and broke through and captured the city of Tyre. And uh, its inhabitants were taken, and those that still survived were sold into slavery, and the city of Tyre ceased to exist. If you go there today, um, that not only is that causeway still still there. In fact, over the years, it has gradually uh, sand has dr has drifted up, and it has become a 
entire peninsula, the entire area is now connected. And on, on the island, there is now a fishing village. Uh, actually, just, just in the last 20, 30, 40 years, uh, they're, they're finally starting to put buildings uh, on, on the, what I, that mole, the, uh, the, the sand that has washed up. The, you can actually see some buildings on that. Um, and if you go down the, the coast about three or four miles, there, there's a city, a modern city called Tyre. Um, but the mainland city, as a big city, was was not rebuilt. I, nowadays, uh, there are suburbs there from uh, <laughs> sort of extended from the, from the city, which is to the south. Now, the prophecy we already looked at that, but let me just uh, sort of refresh your memory. Uh, many nations will come against Tyre. It wasn't just Babylon that would come up against them, but also, but also the the nations that are represented by uh, by Alexander of Macedonia. Her walls and towers will be broken down. Uh, the debris of the city will be removed. Nebuchadnezzar will attack. He did that. The prophecy goes on. The stones and timbers would be thrown into the water. That sounded like something maybe figurative, but no, in this case, Alexander literally did that. Um, that the Tyre would be a, uh, the city of Tyre would be a bare rock and a place for the spreading of nets. This was literally fulfilled. And the city was not rebuilt as a city. Yes, the place of the spreading of nets, that means that there'd, there'd be people there, like the fishing village. Uh, that's true. But the city would not be rebuilt. Now I want to go to a third prophecy. Uh, and this is Daniel's prophecy of King Antiochus uh, the fourth. Now he doesn't mention him by name, because Antiochus hadn't been born in the days of Daniel. Daniel um, is living, and remember we we had found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so that's going to play into into our story, uh, because the book of Daniel, of course, Daniel himself is living uh, in the 500s. Um, um, actually, was alive in the in the early 600s BC. This is all BC, um, but then um, he prophesies about cer- certain events that would take place after him, uh, both the, the rise and fall of Babylon, of course, Babylon ha- had already risen as he was a boy, but its fall and replacement by, by the Persians and the Medes and Persians, but also by Alexander, who is, who is mentioned not by name, but somebody from Greece uh, in, in Daniel's prophecy. Uh, and then a king that would come after this, who would come up against uh, the holy place, uh, up against the Jewish people, up against the temple. And so uh, after Alexander the Great, since we already mentioned him, um, Alexander only lived to be about 33 years old. And uh, he got very sick. Uh, people wondered, did was he poisoned? Was it uh, uh, the results of some earlier wounds? Did he just get malaria? Uh, but for whatever reason, Alexander died uh, when he was about 33 years old. And as he lay on his deathbed, his uh, generals came around and said, to whom should we give your kingdom? And he said to the strongest, and that meant that they just all fought among themselves. Now, two of the survivors of that are mentioned here. Uh, The Ptolemies, uh, one of his generals was named Ptolemy, and uh, Ptolemy grabbed Egypt, uh, which notice uh, Egypt is on the Nile River uh, in our map. And so the Ptolemies grabbed Egypt, and they actually would hold on to it for for several hundred years. From Alexander, uh, his death is in 323 B.C. Uh, We already talked about uh, Tyre in 332, but in 323 B.C. is the death of Alexander. And the Ptolemies rule Egypt from then all the way to the coming of Julius Caesar. Uh, Remember, he comes in uh, in in the 50s B.C., uh, and then you have uh, Cleopatra, the last of the Ptolemies, who rules until about 30, uh, 30 BC. Uh, but the Ptolemies are there in Egypt. And then another one of the generals, Seleucus. And so we're going to refer to his descendants, even though they don't all have the same name. Now, the Ptolemies are easy. Uh, every Ptolemy is called Ptolemy. We refer to them as the first, second, third, fourth, all the way down to Ptolemy the twelfth. And then we have Cleopatra. Uh, but the Seleucids, they have a number of different names. Um, uh, and actually, the first Seleucus had named his capital city Antiochus after his father. Uh, so some of those Seleucids are going to be, be named Seleucus, and some of them will be named Antiochus. And uh, since there had been a few of them, we're going to focus on Antiochus the fourth. Now, the, 
prophecies of Daniel talked about this one who would come up against the people of God and who would come up against the holy place and who would come in, stop the sacrifices of the Jewish people, and set up what was called the abomination of desolation. And sure enough, one of those one of those Seleucids, uh, Antiochus IV, uh, came up against Jerusalem, captured it, and he does this around 168 B.C. Now remember, we asked that question, well, could it not these prophecies have been written uh, sort of... Um, after the fact, well, the problem is that we have Dead Sea Scrolls, including the book of Daniel, and we have copies, a number of copies uh, of various portions of the book of Daniel, including these parts that talk about uh, this section. Um, and <laughs> we, have, we have copies in the second century BC, which is at the time that Antiochus did this. Now, we don't have the original copy that Daniel wrote, um, but the fact that they have copies, and not one, but but a number of, I think there's something like nine different copies of the book of Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they're describing Antiochus who would, who would come into the temple and who would uh, set up this abomination of desolation. By the way, what Antiochus did, uh, he goes into the temple after the Jews had given him some trouble. And he says, you know, your problem is that you're not good Greeks. I'm going to turn you into good Greeks from now on. You're all going to worship like good Greeks. You're going to worship Zeus. And he puts up a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Um, and and uh, I don't know if they were doing this for just to make the king feel better about himself, but it was said that the statue of Zeus, the face on the statue of Zeus, looked like Antiochus himself. It's almost like he had a statue of himself in uh, the temple of Jerusalem in the Holy of Holies. Now, let me just finish the story there. The good news the good news is that the Jewish people revolted, and have, as had been prophesied in Daniel's prophecy, they they fought against this, they resisted, and eventually gained victory and cleansed the temple and drove out the Greeks. The Jewish people, even to this day, actually celebrate this cleansing of the temple. Um, they call it the Feast of Dedication, the way you say that in Hebrew, uh, the Feast of Hanukkah. So uh, that takes place uh, around December each year. So um, when you see that, just sort of think of, of, of the happiness of the Jews of regaining their temple, but also think of Daniel's prophecy and how God had foretold that this would take place, and it did just the way it was described in the pages of Daniel. Finally, and we're not we're just going to introduce it now, but we'll come to this next time. Uh, we have a great many prophecies in the Old Testament, prophecies of Jesus, who of course Jesus wasn't born until um, around uh, around one A.D. Actually, probably a few years earlier, uh, probably about you know five or four B.C. But long after the Dead Sea Scrolls had been written, uh, long after the Old Testament had been uh, had been around for hundreds of years, uh, in fact, the Old Testament had even been uh, translated into other languages, like Greek, uh, by that time. Uh, but we'll look at that next time.